I'm really excited to be with you today to present the top 10 round two application mistakes to avoid at all costs. Um, we're really excited to be presenting this webinar in conjunction with our good friends at CPGMAT. Um, and if you have any questions as I go through these tips, please feel free to go ahead and type your questions into the question box in your GoToWebinar toolbar, and um, I will take the questions um, as I can throughout, uh, throughout the webinar. So let's get started without further ado. So, first our agenda. So what I'm going to start with is a little bit of an introduction about who I am, and then a little bit about Stratus Prep, and then we're going to talk about the return on investment of an MBA, and then we'll go into my top 10 um, round two mistakes to avoid at all costs. And then finally, I have an exclusive offer for our webinar viewers. So for those of you who are uh, frequent members of the BPG Mac community, you've probably seen some of my webinars before, but I am Sean O'Connor, founder and CEO of Stratus Prep. Um, I did both my JD and my MBA with honors from Harvard. At Harvard Business School, I was a Baker Scholar, which is the top 5% of the Harvard Business School class. I did my undergraduate studies at Georgetown, um, and I have previously worked with McKinsey, Lehman Brothers, and a number of other top professional firms. Um, I also have over a decade of admissions counseling and test preparation experience. I write for MBA admissions for Forbes magazine uh, in my twice a week column called The Launching Pad. Um, and so that publishes on Tuesdays about entrepreneurship and on Fridays about MBA admissions. Uh, you'll also find uh, frequent contributions from me in the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, the Financial Times, Business Week, uh, amongst many others. Um, great. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about, um, and I'm getting a, a question here, and I'll ask our staff to go ahead and help with this. Um, somebody is indicating um, that they are not um, able to hear anything or see anything, that they don't even know that the webinar has started. So. Um, um, if, if the team can look into that and see what's going on, that would be great. Um, if other people are experiencing those issues as well, please go ahead and um, type a question in so we know that you're having trouble and we can troubleshoot you individually. All right, great. Um, next, a little bit about Stratus Prep. Um, so as you may know, Stratus Prep is the um, global leader in international uh, and um, American Business School applications and uh, GMAT preparation. So, you know, here is our track record on the left-hand side. Um, so, over 80% of the GMAT students that we work with end up scoring 70, uh, 700 or better on the real GMAT, and over 90% of our students end up scoring 650 or better. Our average score increase is um, over 100 points, and we've had people increase by um, as many as 200 plus points. Um, also, we can, through our uh, admissions process, we can help you um, get into the top schools, even if your numbers aren't perfect. So, for example, last year we had a woman with a 590 who was admitted to Harvard Business School. You know, we've had numerous people in the low 600s admitted to Harvard, Stanford, amongst other top schools. In addition, we can help you earn unsolicited merit-based scholarship monies. Uh, over the last three years, our clients have earned over $15 million in unsolicited merit-based scholarships. So what's our secret? I mean, how are we able to uh, achieve these results? Well, first, in terms of our tutor requirements, they are the strictest in the world. Um, we have every tutor has to have scored a 770 or better. They need to have graduated from a top 10 MBA program and have at least two years of teaching experience before they ever join the Stratus Prep team. In terms of our counselors, they've all graduated from a top 10 MBA program. They have at least two years of admissions experience, um, and in most cases, they have spent a good deal of time reading and interviewing candidates at a top five business program before joining Stratus Prep. And one of the things that really differentiates us and allows us to have unparalleled level of success with clients in more than you know 50 to 100 countries per year is that we take a team-based approach to MBA admissions counseling, where you're going to be working with your counselor, who's a former uh, admissions reader or admissions interviewer from one of the top five schools. You'll also be working with me. Uh, I provide the important strategic input. Um, you'll be working with school-specific essay readers who are former uh, experts on the given school uh, that you would be applying to. And then we have professional proofreaders at the end of the process to make sure that everything is absolutely flawless. So if you combine sort of our track record and our um, strategies and your as well as our hard work, 
um, you know, you can't help but be successful in this process. Over 99% of students each year get into at least one of the schools that they work with Stratus Prep on. Um, and this includes people from some of the toughest demographic groups. For example, uh, last year we had over 100 clients um, from um, India who we were working with. And as you may know, it's one of the most competitive demographics. Every single one of them was admitted to one of the schools of their choice. Um, and you know, we are willing to work with you on any schools um, that you'd like to apply to. We don't uh, try to coach you uh, to go to lower tier schools. You know, Most of our clients are going to either Harvard, Stanford, or Wharton. All right, great. And then I wanted to show you a little bit about our success rates. Um, so as you can see on this slide, over 99% of our students are admitted to at least one of the schools of their choice. Um, our success rates at HBS Lifetime, since our company was founded in 2006, is over 60%. At Wharton, it's over 80%. And this is explained in large part by the fact that we have three former Wharton ad comps on our team. At Columbia, Chicago, it is 70% plus. NYU 75% plus, uh, MIT 65% plus, and then Stanford 40%, although we're very excited because we believe that number is going to um, increase significantly because we just have a slew of people with uh, Stanford interviews this year from round one. Um, so that's a little bit about our firm and a little bit about me. Um, as you may know, I, um, not in addition to my column, the launching pad for Forbes, I also write a weekly column for US News, um, and these are some of the other uh, places where I can be featured. All right, so let's talk about our top 10 round two admission uh, application mistakes to avoid at all costs. And I just love this picture. Go back. You are going the wrong way. All right, number one, failing to do adequate research on the schools so that you can find the highest ranked schools that actually match your interests and background. A lot of people think that it's just about getting into the highest ranked school. But this is a recipe for misery. If you really want to work on your soft skills development, your general management development, you have a passion for entrepreneurship and innovation, and you want to go to a top 10 school, schools like you know, Northwestern and Harvard would be great fits for you. But if you want a general management approach and you want to work on your softer skills, schools like MIT or Chicago Booth are unlikely to be a good match at all, even though they are also ranked in that same area. So you need to find the schools where you will have the highest chances of admission based on what they're looking for, their profile of the ideal student in your background, but also schools where you will be really happy going forward, where you will be able to um, contribute a great deal and learn and get out of the MBA experience you know, what you are really trying to do. So you know, before you just commit to, OK, I'm just going to automatically apply to the top set of schools, before you commit to that, what you're going to want to do is make sure that um, you are really finding schools that are the ideal fit for you. All right. Great. So let's go on then. And as I said, if you have any questions um, at any point throughout the process, you know, please just go ahead and type a question in the question box, and I'll be happy to take it um, at our uh, the earliest possible appropriate stopping point. OK, let's go ahead now to our second tip not owning your recommenders. You really need to own your recommenders. Okay, You can't just send them the link and hope for the best. What you really need to do is send them specific ideas, specific examples that they might want to leverage and utilize in responding to each question that each school is going to ask. Um, and so basically, that is the, um, the, you know, that is the approach um, that you need to take. You have to own your recommenders and take a really proactive um, approach so that you make sure that all of the messaging that you're trying to get through is going to, um, you know, is going to um, be available. Because a lot of people forget that you know the recommenders, um, they are you know pretty limited probably in terms of their time. They could probably spend between 30 and 60 minutes per school for you on your recommendations. And so as a result of that, you know, they don't have unlimited time. And so we need to make it really, really easy for them um, to um, you know, deliver the recommendations that they really need to deliver. Um, and to have you know, good recommendations are replete with tons of examples so that the admissions office does not have to, um, does not have to you know, just sort of um, take your 
uh, recommender's word for it, but they can actually see the examples um, uh, that your recommenders are putting forward. And from those examples, they can come to their own conclusion about just what a stellar applicant you are and how you know, you will be really compelling, but that's only going to happen if you own your recommenders. It is just absolutely essential that you own your recommenders, that you give them those specific ideas and examples that you're hoping that they will respond to in doing each of their questions. So remember um, to, you know, take responsibility for them. Do not leave anything to chance with the recommenders. So a question had come in about, you know, where can I best find the characteristics, especially the uh, softer characteristics, uh, of a given school, like how can I go about finding this information? And so, um, you know, one of the best places to do this is, of course, on the school's own website, and and by doing school visits and talking to alumni who can really share with you, um, you know, what uh, what schools program, what the, you know, each school's programs are, and, and where they really excel versus where you know um, they may not be as strong. Um, but you can also get this, and you know, this is something that we help our clients with all the time from the admissions counselors that you're working with. Um, so you know, what I would say is um, admissions counseling has become almost um, a requirement for MBA admissions these days. I mean, 57 percent of students who apply to um, MBA programs each year now are using admissions counselors. So using an admissions counselor just helps you sort of on par with the rest of the class. Um, using an exceptional admissions counselor like Stratus Prep that's fully accredited and has people who have decades of experience is really where you're going to get that advantage and set yourself apart. So, you know, yes, you can get uh, information on the schools and their strengths from friends and alumni and current students and the websites. Um, those are all great, but you know, typically alumni and current students can't be perhaps as objective as we would like. And so what you're probably going to need to do is also um, is also rely on your admissions counselors. And I just think it would be foolhardy you're about to spend when you account for opportunity costs and the cost of going to school, probably about four hundred thousand dollars to go to business school. It just seems a little bit crazy that you wouldn't, you know, invest one or two percent of that to make sure that you get into the very best possible schools and that you're choosing the very best possible schools by using an admissions counselor, um, you know, who is a real expert in um, in the top fifteen or twenty schools globally. So great question. Thank you so much. All right. So let's move on to our third mistake: failing to recognize the importance of demonstrating a commitment to entrepreneurship in your application. So I'm just going to lay it out there. Entrepreneurship right now is hot, hot, hot when it comes to MBA admissions. You really need to demonstrate entrepreneurial thinking. Welcome to Go to Webinar. Yeah. Web events made easy. You have to tell the admissions committee at the given school what they are looking to buy. Five, ten years ago, they were looking to buy, you know, management consulting experience. Muted. To buy, um, you know, uh, investment banking experience, private equity experience. Well, today they want to buy entrepreneurship. Now, this doesn't mean you have to quit your job and go out and become an entrepreneur, though I don't necessarily uh, dissuade my clients from doing that if that's something that they're interested in. But even if you're going to be working in a large corporate environment, you need to be demonstrating entrepreneurial thinking at every point throughout the process. So, you know, really recognize, I mean, we have people who have started yogurt shops and who have started food trucks who are getting into Harvard and Stanford right now, okay? Um, because of this commitment to entrepreneurship. But we also have folks from, you know, Goldman Sachs and McKinsey who are getting in, but the way they're getting in is very different from in the past. They're not selling themselves as, I'm an investment banker, I'm a management consultant. They're selling themselves as, I'm an entrepreneurial thinker who happens to work in this particular space or this particular industry. So it is critically, critically important to be focused on entrepreneurship today. Um, it is probably the number one thing that you can do to best increase your chances um, at uh, any of the sort of top 10 schools. Next, you really need to incorporate um, a global perspective when you start talking about what are short and long-term goals and why this MBA program. And this isn't true. You know, this used to be true just at sort of the INSEAD of the world, but very, very international schools. But today, it's essential to be conveying this global perspective, um, this global viewpoint on any MBA program, any short and long-term career goals, because schools simply are not entertaining applicants who do not demonstrate that they have a global perspective, that they have a global interest. So you need to show the admissions committees that you are thinking globally, that you are acting globally, that you understand the impact of globalization, and they can count on you to be a global leader within their class. 
So just to review so far, we need to own our recommenders and give them everything that they need so that they can be as successful as possible in you know, giving us very robust application uh, recommendations that are full, chock full of examples um, from our prior interactions which allow the admissions committee to just determine who we are without having to believe the recommenders. Number two, we also need to make sure that we are choosing schools that are the best fit for our background and that are the best fit for our future interests. And then we need to demonstrate the key characteristics that MBA admissions officers are looking to buy today. They really, really, really want you to buy um, you know, the global aspects of it. So, you know, they want to buy uh, that you're an entrepreneur, and they want to buy that you are a global entrepreneur, that you are somebody with a global perspective. So entrepreneurship and global, two key traits at all of the top five or top ten business schools today. Do not forget them. Do not leave them out. If you do so, you do so at your own peril. All right, mistake number five, overemphasizing the GMAT and underemphasizing the importance of the essays and recommendations. So let me be absolutely clear. An 800 or a 790 or a 780 GMAT score does not guarantee you into admission at any of the top business school programs. The essays and the recommendations are always far more important components. They are always the linchpin to getting into these schools. Because think about it. Uh, what does the GMAT tell, tell an admissions officer? The GMAT tells them that you probably won't fail out. Right? That's all that the GMAT tells them is that you, have, you need the minimum competency when it comes to mathematical uh, capabilities and English uh, writing and reading capabilities. But that does not tell them in any way that you are going to be the next Warren Buffett or the next Mark Zuckerberg or the next Bill Gates. It does not in any way demonstrate your leadership skills, your global perspectives, how you are going to contribute to the classroom. And that is what has to come through in the essays and the recommendations. So the admissions committee is going to look at your application holistically. For example, last year, we had somebody with a 2.9 who was admitted to Wharton. We had somebody who was a, um, an overrepresented male in finance with a 3.0 who not only got into Wharton, but got in with a half merit-based scholarship. So that's about $75,000 over the course of two years. Um, you know, so that just demonstrates, and, and both of those applicants, the 299 and the 30, each had 710 and 700 respectively. So they had good GMAT scores, but they did not have perfect or ideal or amazing GMAT scores. But what they did have, and what everybody who's in the know knows, is that they had amazing essays and recommendations. Um, and so you really, really need to focus on that as a core, core, core component of your application. Um, you know, the GMAT is important, but the GMAT is just like a fence. You just have to get over that fence. And once you get over the fence, it does not matter by how much you get over the fence. Once you have demonstrated that, you know, you are um, a competitive applicant who clearly can handle the academic rigor of an MBA program, it doesn't, mention, it doesn't matter how much more you do in that realm. So it's so important to focus on the essays. That is your point to stand out, is your chance to differentiate you from other people like you. Um, and then in terms of the recommendations, you know, this is, this is the opportunity for the schools to get a really objective perspective on you so that they can be as successful as possible in working with you. All right, so we have a couple of questions, so let me review those. If you're an international applicant with lots of varied international experience, at what point in applying should you focus on this? Essays, resume, interview. Well, you absolutely um, need to focus on this in the essays and the resume because we want to sell, 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 sell how you are going to be a uh, sort of you know, global leader and an entrepreneurial leader throughout your application process. And you know, we don't want to hold anything back for the interview. Um, we want to make sure that we're putting everything out there. And then when it comes to the interview, we'll use that to give context as to how we're going to be successful. So if you're an international applicant with lots of great international and entrepreneurial experience, let's get that out there right away. That is going to be absolutely essential. Next. How less likely is a candidate to get accepted with a lower than average GMAT score? So obviously the GMAT score um, is one important component, but we have people every year who get accepted at every top school. You know, we have people interviewing this year with under 650 at Harvard, under 650 at Stanford, under 650 at Wood. So um, you know, are your chances somewhat diminished? I mean, obviously it would be great to have 
a high GMAT, a high GPA, perfect, you know, entrepreneurial global experiences to talk about in the essays and the recommendations, the resume, and the interview. Obviously, it would be ideal to have the higher versus the lower GMAT score. But in terms of the GMAT score is not used by any school to admit students. It's only used to exclude students who they feel just won't be able to survive, um, to survive the um, the rigors of the program. And so, um, you know, that's why we want to sort of clear this GMAT. And once we clear it, forget about it. You've cleared it. You've demonstrated your potential. And then from there, we'll just focus on the essays and the recommendations and the resume and the interview, which is really how you're going to go ahead and get admitted. OK. So now we come to my sixth tip, failure to illustrate how you will contribute to the class in a collaborative and inclusive way. So they really want to see that you are going to be um, a collaborative and cooperative learner, that you're going to be somebody who really gains from um, or leverages and utilizes and benefits from a really, really collaborative and inclusive approach. So you know you need to show the admissions committee how you are going to make the school a better place for your being there, how you are going to make really unique contributions, and that those unique contributions will be tremendously valuable in sort of you attaining your success. Okay? So that is our sixth um, key thing. So what do, what do we know so far that the admissions committees are looking for? We know that they're looking for people with a global perspective, people with an entrepreneurial perspective, but also individuals who are committed to enhancing their community through a collaborative and inclusive approach. All right, so we have another question. I will be 33 years of age at the time of matriculation. How do I address this in my essays? I'm assuming that not acknowledging it at all would be a mistake. Um, um, well, they'll know how old you are. So it's like you don't, I mean, you don't need to acknowledge it. Um, I wouldn't make age an issue. Okay, we've worked with people 35, 36, 37, and helped them into schools that are even notoriously anti-older applicants, like a Harvard or a Stanford, especially Harvard. So we've been able to help people into those schools. But what we do is we don't focus on age, because it really shouldn't be about age. It shouldn't be about a number. It should be about where you are in your career right now and how successful you're going to be in your career. Um, so you know we need to make sure that we're not making the issue about age, because if you make the issue about age and you're 33, you're probably going to lose. But if you make the issue about why you belong in their class, what you will be able to contribute, how your unique experiences will make you distinctive and allow you to bring into the classroom a very different um, viewpoint than a lot of other students may have, that's what's going to make you really successful as an older applicant. Um, it's about showing that now is the right time for you to get an MBA, that it wouldn't have made sense to get it earlier. It makes sense to get it now, and then it's going to allow you to contribute in a really distinctive and unique way. OK. So now number six. I'm sorry, number seven. I apologize. We don't want to reiterate the resume in your essays. This is probably the number one mistake that I see when people first walk in the door. The admissions committee wants to get to know you personally beyond your resume. If they just needed your resume, they wouldn't have essay questions. And so a lot of people make the mistake of just repeating, repeating over and over and over again, uh, repeating their resume and um, you know just sort of using the essays to really try to highlight the resume and highlight the things that um, that they're going, you know, that they think are really awesome from their resume and will really make them stand out. But you know, just reiterating your resume is really a wasted use of your essays. What you want to do in your essays, sure, there will be some some things from your resume that make it into your essays. But what you want to do is not simply reiterate the resume in your essays, but instead use the essays to contextualize it. Use the essays to make it personal. You know, if you're talking about that you want to do impact investing or that you want to do social enterprise or you want to do nonprofit consulting or whatever the case may be, or you want to foster you know, economic development or whatever the case may be, what you want to do is not reiterate your essay, or your resume about the essays, but instead use those essays to demonstrate where does this passion come from? Why are you so committed to being a nonprofit leader? Why are you so committed to uh, being a leader on issues of economic development um, or you know, ethics in business or whatever the case may be? So please do not just use the essays to reiterate your resume. It is a recipe for disaster. All right. Tip number eight, failing to recognize the importance of differentiating yourself from other applicants like you. 
and they represent your direct competition. So who are you competing against? You're not competing against that big global pool that I am demonstrating by the large bucket on uh, the left-hand side of the screen. That's not who you're competing against. Who you are competing against is actually people from the same you know, school as you, same undergraduate school as you, people from the same um, you know, disciplinary background, if you're an engineer, other engineers, if you, know, you come from a political science background, other people who are applying from a political science background, people from your same company, people from your same industry, people from the same geographic location as you. Um, so these are who you are competing against, and we always want to keep that in mind because a lot of people make the mistake of trying to differentiate themselves from this big global applicant pool. And that's not going to be successful. What's going to be successful is you distinguishing yourself is a much harder job, you distinguishing yourself from other people very much like you who have um, a geographic perspective in common with you, that have a functional perspective in common with you, that come from the same you know, area or region. Uh, <clears throat> that have some more academic and extracurricular experiences as you, that's what's going to be really essential and make you successful. All right, number nine, the ninth mistake to avoid is you don't want to apply in a later round than you can and should apply. If you can apply in the earliest possible round, if you're thinking about applying next year, absolutely round one, round one, 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 one. Don't let anybody tell you any differently. Some people say, oh, no, round one is much more competitive because all the best people apply in round one because they have been planning to apply for a year. Well, it is true that round one includes a lot of really, really qualified people, but guess what? The schools adjust for that, and they even overcompensate for that by increasing the acceptance rate in round one because they know that traditionally this is the pick of the litter. And so even though um, there are more people applying in round one often and there are stronger applicants in round one, it is always easiest to get in in round one. Round two is still very, very, very legitimate. It'll be a little bit tougher than round one, but still you have a very, very strong chance. A lot of schools fill 40 45% of their seats in round two, so still lots of opportunity to be successful. But you don't ever want to apply in round three. Unless you have won a Nobel Prize, uh, a written in New York Times bestseller, something like that, you are very, very unlikely to get in in round three. Um, most schools, 95 plus percent of their class has already been filled by round three, so you're very unlikely to be successful if you wait to round three. So if you're applying this year, round two, absolutely, you must do all of those January deadlines. You cannot push anything until the March deadlines of round three. If you're applying next year, you want to start. We, I, you know, earlier today, I've already had two strategy calls with people who are applying next year who have already been working with us for a couple of months now because we are making absolutely sure that their round one applications are going to be stellar. And let me let you in on a little secret. The end of the year is a very good time to start working with an admissions counselor because whatever changes we make to your profile, to your resume, will all be represented as. 2013. And so they don't know whether you did that on the first day of 2013 or on the last day of 2013. So in terms of working with your admissions counselor now to get ready for round one of next year, and we don't charge anything extra, you can get started whenever you'd like, but getting started now makes a ton of sense. And that's what we were doing on uh, some calls I had with my team earlier this morning with our clients, is we were going through and figuring out, okay, for round one of next year, you know, if, if you don't, if you decide not to apply in round two of this year and instead apply in round one of next year, what can and should we be doing now in November, in December of 2013 to make us most competitive? Um, you know, for round two, you should be well underway. If um, you haven't um, started your work um, with an admissions counselor, you really need to get started in the next week or two um, because you really, really, really need to put your best foot forward. Round two is extraordinarily competitive more so than round one. And so we need to put together, you know, our very best application. And the only way to do that is by getting started now. You know, we have, um, you know, those extraordinary success rates you've seen lifetime since 2006 at Harvard and Wharton and uh, Columbia and Chicago. But, you know, those don't just, you know, happen by circumstance. We don't just sort of sprinkle some pixie dust on your application and then you automatically get an interview and get admitted. Instead, it takes six to eight weeks of really hard work. And so, you know, if you're going to want to leverage that kind of help for round two, now is absolutely the absolute time where it's critical, it's essential to get started. 
All right, and then mistake number 10, my final mistake of what you don't want to do to jeopardize your chances uh, of getting into a top tier MBA program is applying without the expertise of an accredited admissions counselor who has the repeat player experience that will make you most competitive at your stretch schools. So there's lots of admissions counselors out there who just, you know, maybe they went to a top 10 MBA, maybe they didn't even do that, and they just sort of stick their, their uh, sign out and say, I'm here, I'm an admissions counselor. Well, you certainly should not be entrusting your future to some charlatan like that. Um, you want to make sure that you, whether you want to start a step for another firm, make sure that you work with an accredited firm. Accredited firms have demonstrated the integrity, the honesty, the knowledge and expertise and experience to receive full accreditation. So I am fully accredited by the Association of International Graduate Admissions Counselors. Uh, and you want to make sure that uh, whoever you work with is somebody who has that accreditation. And in some countries, for example, there is no on the ground, um, you know, for example, in India, none of the Indian firms are accredited and none of the Indian um, individual counselors at those firms are accredited. And so you probably don't want to be using somebody who is not accredited because that either means that they don't meet the basics of ethics or that they don't meet the basic knowledge test to, um, you know, to obtain their accreditation. So you know, really make sure that you are using with the best people uh, in the world. Um, you also need to make sure that um, you know, your experts, um, admissions counselors who are working with you really understand your industry your background, your geography. Um, you know, I travel throughout the world. I just came back from a, an MBA tour um, where I was asked to speak in, in you know, eight cities in ten days around the world. And um, you know, what you learn is that there, are, you know, are a lot of admissions folks who just have no idea how to work with an applicant from Asia or an applicant from South America. Um, and so, you know, it's absolutely essential that before you decide which counselor to use, that you make sure um, to explore that they, to ensure that they have the expertise um, to work on your specific profile. Okay. Um, and so when we work with applicants, this is uh, sort of how we work step by step with our applicants. First, we do a diagnosis of your strengths and weaknesses so that we can improve your profile. Next, we provide you with that inside information on the relative strengths and weaknesses of the schools, the reputation of the schools in different industries. Then we assist you in selecting the schools that best match your interests based on the actual information that, um, that those schools um, you know, are putting forth and that we have developed over years of studying those schools. Um, then we have extensive brainstorming and introspection and then discussions around that in, that. Uh, that introspection to make sure that you are developing the very, very, very best possible topics and structures for your essays. Then number five, you need to review and edit your essays as well as your short answers um, and your resumes. Um, and so that's something that is, you know, absolutely essential. And, you know, we do unlimited rounds of edits. When you work with us, every single essay at Stratus Prep is reviewed by your counselor multiple times, five, six times then by a school-specific expert who, in almost every case, is a former admissions uh, committee member at that school, and then by our professional proofreading staff. Make sure that in number six, uh, we're going to help you with selecting the right people to draft your recommendation letters, and then use our proprietary strategies to ensure that you coach them to get the very best possible letters of recommendation. Then we're going to prepare you for our live and video interviews. More and more schools are moving towards the Skype system, but um, we'll prepare you for all of the interviews that you uh, encounter throughout your process. Um, then if you're waitlisted, there's a lot you can do to improve your chances, uh, and so we have a game plan that we provide for that. And then, again, something that so many folks don't pay attention to, but it's something that you should be investing a lot of time and money in, which is coming up for a, with a winning strategy for negotiating the maximum possible financial aid award. So one individual had asked a question, so let me go ahead and grab that. Um, how do you match applicants with counselors? So a couple of things that are worth noting. At Stratus Prep, all of our admissions counselors are full-time. This is their main source of income. They work with us full-time. Um, and so that's really different. A lot of firms use individuals who are moonlighting. You know, they have a job at McKinsey or Goldman, and they're just doing this for some extra vacation money. Well, you can imagine who gets a higher quality level of feedback. You know, the student who's working with someone who's going to be looking at this at midnight um, after a long day of work um, and who, you know, doesn't really need this job or this money versus someone who's working with an admissions counselor like the team here at Stratus Prep that are all, are all 
full-time dedicated to your success. We also make sure that um, each counselor only works with five or six students per round so that they have all the time they need to be able to give you all of the help and assistance you need throughout the entire process. So that's something that is really critical. Then we match you based on the schools that you're interested in, your career and professional and personal background, as well as where you want to go in the future, making sure that um, you are working with counselors who can best put forward this story. And at any time, you can switch counselors. No problem whatsoever. Just let us know. Um, and we're more than happy to uh, have you switch counselors. We can also have you speak to some of our counselors in advance before you get started or you know, right after you get started if you'd like to get to know them a little better before starting your work with one of them. All right, so that's sort of how the admissions counseling process works. Um, and then on the last slide here, uh, or the penultimate slide, I should say, here are some success stories. So you see Victor. 3 uh, equivalent from a um, from an Indian university, 670 on the GMAT. We helped him into HBS. He was a former uh, management consultant and entrepreneur. Alex went to a small liberal arts school um, here in the U.S., 3-7, but only a 670, four years in finance, um, and he came from an overrepresented background. Um, and he got into both HBS and Columbia. Rob, top 25 undergraduate college, again, 3-7 and 700 gets into Stanford, just goes to prove that it's not all about the numbers. And then Julia, top 25 undergraduate college, very high GMAT, which really appeals to Wharton, 720, uh, but only a 2.7, but she was in mid Wharton. So you can see here that, you know, even though Wharton may care the most about, you know, the quant side of the GMAT, people who don't even have perfect GMAT scores get into Wharton. People who don't have perfect GPAs, even though Harvard values GPAs a lot, um, they still get into Harvard with our help. All right, so this is my last slide for today, and I really appreciate everybody joining us. You are entitled for attending this webinar um, to a 10% um, off discount on any Stratoscrap services, whether for GMAT prep, which we only do GMAT tutoring because we find that classes are simply not, um, not having the kind of impact that you need to have. Um, so 10% off if you enroll in any of our GMAT prep or admissions counseling services by the end of November. You can use enrollment code capital N-O-V and then the number is 1-0. Um, I'm also happy to provide a 30-minute free consultation uh, if you would like. Um, so we can schedule that you know, in person if you're in New York or over the phone or via Skype if you're in any other part of the country or overseas. And I would be happy. now. Let me clarify what we can do in this 30-minute consultation. I can't read essays and tell you if they make sense or not. I can't um, tell you if your recommenders make sense because I don't know you well enough. We take 8 to 10 hours to get to know you really well after you sign up before we start you know, dispensing advice on what your essays should be about and what your recommendations should be about and what your recommenders should highlight. So please, please, please understand that as much as I'd love to be able to share that sort of um, information with you during the 30-minute um, consultation. I simply don't have the background to do that. So what we can do in the 30-minute consultation is speak about what is our plan for success going forward? How are we going to position you for success? Um, and so, you know, basically, what do you need to be doing now? What do you need to be doing next week and the week after in order to successfully apply, you know, whether it's in this year's round two or next year's round one? If you'd like to set up that consultation, go ahead and email me at uh, consult at stratuscrap.com, and our team members will be more than happy to get you on my calendar. Again, that's consult at stratuscrap.com. You can also uh, check us out online, make purchases of any of the programs that you might be interested in using the discount code at any time of day or night online at www.stratuscrap.com. And also feel free to give our office a buzz anytime between 9 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday through Friday, um, New York time. Uh, feel free to give us a buzz. Um, and myself and Daniel and the rest of the team would be really happy to assist you as you um, try to determine if it would make sense to uh, leverage our many, many, many years, um, decades really, of, um, of success uh, in order to to make you most successful in applying to the school of your choice. I mean, you've worked really hard to get this far in terms of your GPA and your work experience, and you really deserve now to get into the best school that you possibly can, and that's where Stratus Prep can help. All right, great. So um, if you have any questions, I see a couple of questions here, but if you have any questions, please go ahead and type those into the GoToWebinar, um, into the GoToWebinar toolbox, and I'll be happy to answer those questions in the order that they 
that they come in. How do you work with students from non-traditional backgrounds, such as physicians, for example? So we've had many physicians who were admitted to you know, the very top schools in the world. And what we do there is we really try to use the fact that you are in one field and are now you know, sort of pivoting to management. We do that. Um, we want to demonstrate that you're you know, really unique and successful in what unique and diverse perspectives you'll bring to the class, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that is really a winning strategy for getting in as a non-traditional applicant, whether somebody who's from a field outside of management or somebody who's a little bit on the older side. Um, this is the key to success. How can you negotiate financial aid offers? Well, financial aid offers are always negotiable. Okay, and so you should be negotiating them, and that's something that we help our clients with. Um, so if you have an offer from one school, you can go back to that school in an effort to obtain additional aid. You can go to other schools that you might prefer to attend rather than the school where you have the scholarship offer and shop that offer to try to get other schools to match it in part or in whole. So absolutely, financial aid is always negotiable, but you have to do it in a really professional way. All right, does having an MS in the physical sciences help with applying for an MBA program? So having an, a master's um, in any sort of other field other than management does not necessarily help or hurt you. Um, it's certainly not going to hurt you to have a master's, and particularly if you didn't do quite as well in undergrad and then you do way better in the master's, that will actually be helpful. Um, but, you know, just because you have an MS in the sciences or in engineering, you know, the schools are not going to look at you as intrinsically any stronger of an applicant than somebody who just has an undergraduate degree. Um, but, you know, it definitely can be utilized to show the depth of your interests. It can be utilized to show, you know, you know how your undergraduate grades or perhaps your GMAT grade are not indicative of your full potential. Do you also help students applying to schools outside of the U.S.? Absolutely. So every year we help many, many students who are applying to INSEAD, IMB, and HEC Paris, and IE, and IESC, and London Business School, and London School of Economics, um, you know, as well as um, you know, the Chinese University in Hong Kong, and INSEAD um, Asia campus. So you know, every year we are working with numerous applicants to programs both inside and outside the United States. Great, so if you have any more questions, please go ahead and type them into the question box now. Also remember that um, you are entitled to 10% off any of our um, unparalleled um, you know, admissions counseling uh, and GMAT test preparation services. You know, remember that 90% of our students score 650 or better, 80% score 700 or better, which uh, is really a track record of success that we are tremendously proud of. Uh, and then when it comes to admissions counseling, remember that over 99% of our applicants are admitted to at least one of their schools uh, that they were working on with us. Great. So I don't see any more questions right now. So I would like to thank everyone um, in the Beat the GMAT family for joining us for this joint presentation of Beat the GMAT and Stratuscraft on the 12 mistakes to avoid on your round two MBA application. This is Sean O'Connor, founder and CEO of Stratus Prep. It has really been my privilege speaking with you um, this afternoon or whatever time it may be, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and thank you so much for your active participation and for reaching out and um, asking some really intriguing and worthwhile um, questions. I would be really excited, as would my team uh, be, to work with you on your applications. But if you're applying in round two, remember, Time is of the essence, so we need to get started as soon as possible. So have a great rest of the day, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Stratus Path Beat the GMAT webinar. <laughs>